Uh, I have to say that I'm incredibly excited that this day has come because this day is direct result of the a lot of work that we've been put into for the last couple of weeks, even months. Uh, first, I want to say a huge thank you once again to all of the team members. It's been a dozen of us. And when a couple of months ago, uh, CEO of the Academy, Gary, approached me and asked to form a wonderful group of brilliant young minds to give a fresh perspective on uh, global burning problems, it wasn't an easy task. But I'm beyond grateful to be sharing the stage today with these incredible individuals. And I'm so happy to, that I'm able to introduce each one of them to all of you and that you have this opportunity to listen to their perspectives. Uh, it's been a beautiful uh, pleasure, beautiful journey. Uh, all of our sessions, brainstorming sessions that we had throughout our Sundays. Uh, and the most important thing is that what we focused on is this multidisciplinary approach that is a core value of the Academy as well. Each one of us here uh, has different background, different educational background, different cultural background as well. So looking at the same problem from a different perspectives and trying to find a solution, uh, it's been a very enriching experience. And I believe this is just a start. And now I would like to give floor to my colleagues, the speakers. Uh, the concept of today's panel is going to be that after this, uh, after this introduction, I'm going to introduce each one of the speakers and then I will give them the floor for 10 minutes. And after all of that, we will have Q&A session uh, last 30 minutes. So all of the participants feel free to send questions in our Q&A or chat uh, publicly or directly to us. And at the end of the speeches, I will read all of them and we will propose the questions to our speakers. So thank you everyone. And uh, I believe we can start with our first speaker who is Mr. Efan. Uh, it's my true pleasure to introduce Efan to this group. Efan is a dedicated and passionate professional with a strong background in systems me and mechanical engineering. His impressive work includes developing autonomous underwater vehicles and critical rescue systems that were instrumental during the 2030 Turkey earthquake. As an associate member of the Institution of the Mechanical Engineers, Efan combines his hands-on experience with academic excellence. So currently, Efan is pursuing a master's degree in technology management at University College London under the Department of Space and Climate Physics. So Evan's commitment to innovation and his contributions to life-saving technologies are truly inspiring. Evan, we would love to hear more from you. The floor is yours and welcome. Thank you, Dora, for the very warm introduction and thank you for making this panel possible. The conversations we had for the past few weeks were uh, especially a pleasure, but also an honor. And here we are. Uh, we are going to ex actually talk about it. Um, so thank you for thank you to you first of all, and to all the experts that's been part of this uh, journey of World Academy of Art and Science. Just to start, I want to take this opportunity for everyone to actually just imagine themselves as aliens in this planet and within this presentation we're gonna study a very particular intelligent animal that we've been seeing in space and pretty much besides all the intelligent animals we've seen uh, the ability to use technology has um, excluded this specific species from others and thus i want you to reflect on the underrated power of the forms signs and words we, util we utilize in our everyday life. These tools of communication are human creations crafted from our collective imagination and culture. They are the essence of how we share knowledge, express emotions and convey ideas. So basically in this table, you will be able to see the sociocultural evolution through communication technologies. We had previously the early human societies that uh, started communicating with oral traditions that enabled knowledge, traditions, and cultural norms to be passed down. Eventually, this uh, led to a socio-cultural change within the species itself. And this enabled forming of early type of civilizations. 
Then we had the writing. The invention of writing enabled the storage and transmission of knowledge across time and space. Digitalization of bureaucracy, libraries, law systems, and so on. Which the most important probably uh, was the printing technology, as it had it led to the Renaissance, Reformation, and the Scientific Revolution, with books and. The trend goes on with the modern era, digital revolution, which each step of technological uh, innovation, the human has actually evolved, social culture. With, within this table, I want to actually emphasize a trend here. Within each um, adoption of technological artifacts, uh, with respect to tech, the, tech, the adoption happened in two ways. One, the technological determinism and social construction of technology. The first suggests a technology push where research and development drive social and cultural changes, while the later argues that the social, cultural and economic factor factors influence what technologies are developed and how they are used. Nevertheless, both of the drive drivers of adoption blinded the human agency to the potential negative impacts of unchecked technology evolution of each artifact. So with each artifact, information has been democratized, a revolution has happened, and a new era has begun. And now I want to show you this, because now we are at the beginning of a new era. We have ended the digital era and we are moving forward. We are transitioning from the digital age into a future with artificial intelligence. Today, we possess the capability to process or compute information at speeds unimaginable just a few decades ago. And the trend, as can be seen from the graph, has only begun. And you, I should emphasize that it's not linear anymore. It's exponential. With these ad advancements, we edge closer to creating an artificial general intelligence that can learn and improve autonomously, decide on its own, as can be seen from the right. Based on a small input or a prompt, the AI agent can actually hypothetically have no limit. This progress comes with profound uncertainties, of course. AI remain, remains in many ways a black box. Its processes and decisions are often instructable. Our current practical understanding of AI is similar to our understanding of fire in the ancient era. Like fire, AI can bring in immense benefits, improve healthcare, enhance education, but also solve complex problems. But on the other hand, here we have the worst side of AI. As like fire, it can cause catastrophic harm if misused. To illustrate the potential danger, I want to consider this analogy uh, of AI and a mirror. AI is like a mirror reflecting the data or the label we feed it. If we provide it with images of beauty and inspiration, it can create wonders. However, if we expose it to horror or, and violence, it can adopt those traits. A chilling exp experiment demonstrated this when AI trained on biased, violent and disturbing content, it began to exhibit psychopathic behaviors. And it was actually it, its name was Norman, which can be seen on the left. So the mathematical principles behind AI are part of the universe's fabric, just like fire. We simply use this mathematical fabric to reflect to on our own data, which is our language, our emotions, history, and intentions. But to be honest so far, let's reflect on what it says about us. As it can be seen here, we, I mean, the human species has literally copied itself into another neural, neural network. It's actually quite funny to see a robot resembled to a human and even assigned an identity. Accordingly, we ask and interview this robot on what it thinks about humans. We question, and so far, you can see it pretty much reflects what the humans are capable of. 
So AI models are not children learning. They are reflections of the data we provide. If we fear these reflections, it is because we fear ourselves. We fear that AI might treat us as we have treated each other, animals, and also how we treated our planet. The physical reality of the human species existence is a fact. And its rarity, the rarity of intelligence uh, and life is also within the vastness of space is also a rarity. And that is also a fact. We are not the only intelligent species, though. We have animals, dolphins, but uh, again, our ability to use technology distinguishes us from the others. Yet the 21st century human must face many existential risks. While AI is one of them, as it can be seen here within the escalating nexus of existential threats um, and crisis, it is also the tool which can solve many of them. And I want to take this opportunity to address the academy and to ensure that when we look into, into the mirror, we both literally and metaphorically see the best ver version of ourselves, and so does AI. We need to create a sustainable future starting within ourselves, within the people that stands between the triangle. That's why I, we came up with the idea of a global common moral language and also can be considered as a license for undivided wholeness, wholeness within cross-cultural boundaries. So as the Academy is an agency for human welfare, with this framework, I believe a collaborative attitude with polarized expertise can meet again. Knowledge, skills, and attitudes can meet within the boundaries of common values. So I would like to propose the idea of having a platform. Uh, it's not I, we would like to propose the idea of having a common pl platform, which is uh, to have core universal moral and ethical values that transcend cultural, religious, and national boundaries. As an example, this can be focused on dignity, justice, compassion, sustainability, and responsibility. But it is for sure that it needs to cross philosophical, religious, and cultural foundations. It needs to meet the commonalities between topics. And while experts are polarized and interdisciplinary experts should take in place so that transdisciplinary bridges can be formed and can be addressed, a common language can be formed while actually the same thing can be translated into different languages. Um, and within this context, global stakeholders are also important. We need to take we need to take into account experts, but also the people, because without all of us, there will be none of us. Uh, then we have we have discussed about the development of an educational and training program as um, a comprehensive cu curriculum, a common curriculum among nations could actually uh, help us create values, reason behind them, and actually apply them within our everyday life as professionals and as aspiring uh, adults. Then we, we have thought of online training platform, interactive workshops. Finally, we have thought of how we can actually implement this into our daily life. life with exams and assessment structures, tier-like tier certification levels, and even so, renewal and continuing education. But the question again becomes, why do it? Why be ethical? Why be moral? And um, the, when we try to co question what's behind it, um, I want to use specifically this picture of Dolores from Westworld 3, which is a, a series that I like. Uh, I could have used many philosophical uh, authors so far, but the sentence that was used within the context of the series was quite important. Dolores is actually an AI uh, shaped and also uh, become sentient 
within uh, a robotic body. And within the history of the movie, she basically makes a choice. She makes a choice about being moral. She makes a choice about being good. She makes a choice about looking at the beauty of things. And um, either we will have that choice or we're going to let artificial intelligence as artificial grass to decide or choose for us. And as a person who who care, who who likes the human nature, who likes philosophy, I uh, sometimes what it takes to a system to work properly is a small touch. And in this case, I believe it is a fundamental one that we have missed a lo long time ago. And if we successfully implement the ethical and moral values into the average 21st century human being, we believe we can make a step. We can touch the system in a way that can affect the behavior of the whole economies that shape around, around us, the, econom the circular economy that we want to create. So undivided wholeness can only become with a common language and motivation that's formed on ethical and moral boundaries. And from a perspective of regulatory po point of view, uh, a license could, could be Im implicated. The motivation can be attached to visa and visa applications or even um, travel insurances. This can be, uh, this should be directly related and implied into our economy. It's It shouldn't be left to our choice, but to scenarios in which we need a certificate to proceed, either to go to another country, eager to, e either to apply to university, or either to apply into an organization. This is, of course, just a brainstorming ideas that we have come upon and hope that it can be more explored with the academia. Thank you. Thank you, Efe, so much. Uh, I will, I, I'm completely impressed uh, by your speech as always, and I believe like all of the others, um, and especially what you mentioned, if we fear AI, it means we fear ourselves. So uh, our next speaker is a remarkable young individual from London. Uh, Tommy is a student who excels in history, classics, and philosophy. His deep understanding of those subjects and his true dedication to academic excellence are truly inspiring. Tommy's intellectual curiosity and profound understanding make him a standout student poised to make a significant contributions to his field of studies. So Tommy, we are very excited to hear your voice today and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I What I want to talk about today um, really is about war and conflict, um, which unfortunately has been a terrible constant throughout human history. Um, but over time, war and conflict has evolved from wars being fought between peoples, a bit, bit between kings and monarchs and um, individual governments alone, to wars being fought between peoples. And as such, wars have become a social phenomenon as much as a political phenomenon. But peace talks and conflict resolution have largely stayed at the treaty table. And I think that in approaching the issue of conflict resolution and in approaching the issue of preventing conflict in the first place, we will have to move beyond um, a geopolitical perspective towards what I would call an anthropological or a bottom-up perspective. Um, and for that reason, I think it's important to look at the historical precedent that we face today. Uh, the historical precedent behind a sort of bottom-up approach to conflict resolution. In North and South Korea, for instance, a lack of contact has made it harder for North Koreans who go back, go into South Korea to assimilate in society. The North Korean government has actively prevented contact between the two peoples for this reason. South Koreans and North Koreans both have family links. 
Yeah, because of the fact that so few see each other on a regular basis due to the demilitarized zone and the hard border, very few have regular contact. And as such, there is very little understanding. We can see in apartheid South Africa that it was increased contact and communication between the white minority and the black majority, which played a major role in ending apartheid through political pressure on the government. Without that contact, and there was none at any meaningful level, at any meaningful level prior to the 1980s, conflict ensued. However, during in the 1950s and the 1960s, when um, apartheid was at its sort of height, um, in the city of Johannesburg, where there was a great deal of contact between the various ethnic groups, there was in fact a greater degree of understanding which didn't exist at the same level in the rest of the of the country. So I think it's clear from those two examples um, that that there is that the importance of social contact and communication is essential to dealing with conflict resolution. Um, to look at conflicts which currently exist today, um, we have the war in Israel and Gaza. And interestingly, I heard a story about a British journalist who was taken to uh, the West Bank in 2010 or 2011 he was being driven around um and he they were trying to get to ramallah to conduct an interview there and they were going through checkpoint after checkpoint border after border wall after wall and his uh, friend who was um uh, had israeli citizenship but was a palestinian arab by um ethnicity sighed and said oh the good old days before we had peace and the journalist said what do you mean by that? And he explained to him that prior to the imposition of peace talks at a sort of geopolitical level between the Palestinian or liberation organization and the Israeli government, before the UN set up, um, you know, a, a mission to try and solve the fighting from a sort of top down perspective. Um, prior to that, in the 1960s, there was actually a lot of contact between the two people. Lots of Palestinians had jobs in Israel and Israelis would often visit the West Bank and Gaza um, for the nightlife, for example. And it was that small, low level contact on a regular daily basis that actually made things better, that helped um, prevent the comp that helped day to day contact between the two peoples. And that increased understanding. If we look today at Israel and Palestine, there is a lack of contact between the two peoples because of the walls, because of the borders, because of the fences. And for that reason, we've seen the, uh, the rise of far right extremism in Israel with the Kahanist party and a variety of individuals who have entered the Israeli cabinet who are actively opposed to contact between the two peoples of any kind. And as we've seen in the last six, seven, eight months in the conflict in the region, the, the consequences of that have been severe. And so I, I think that the that it's also particularly apparent from the war in Ukraine at the moment. Um, if you look at the, the number of Ukrainians who have relatives in Russia, that there are 20 million, you know, roughly half of the country. But communication and contact is limited by the fact that news networks in Russia that most R Russians rely on don't tell them the truth about what's going on. There was a story of, a, of an accountant, a 62-year-old Ukrainian accountant with Russian parents and grandparents, who spoke to her family in the first days of the invasion, and many of her relatives had no idea what was going on, and they no longer speak to her. Um, and so access to free information will need to be improved so that communication and contact can take place. And that is very difficult to do in Ukraine and Russia at the moment, and that is a, a, a you know a serious obstacle to to peace. If we look at potential conflicts in the world in northeast Africa between Ethiopia and Egypt, we see that a lack of communication between not only governments but between peoples has also exacerbated the issue, um, particularly in regard to um, Egyptian sort of uh, protectionism over the Nile uh, River and the Ethiopian um, objective to build the Renaissance Dam, which has caused serious tensions between the two. But for example, in Taiwan, um, it's apparent that the conflict there has actually been sort of 
perhaps prevented somewhat by the degree of communication that exists. Taiwan, uh, Foxconn, uh, Taiwan's largest company, has 12 factories in nine mainland Chinese cities. Um, lots of Taiwanese people have relatives in China. 12,000 students, 12,000 Taiwanese students study in the mainland. And these business, trade and social links may be responsible for preventing a war if they can be leveraged correctly. And so far, thank goodness, there hasn't been a war in Taiwan. Um, so I think it's apparent for that reason, the comparison between the tensions in Northeast Africa and to compare it to the tensions in Taiwan and China, it's apparent that the the communication between the two peoples is a is a major part in preventing conflict from breaking out in the first place. We just heard um, Efferhan talking a great deal about a global common moral language, and that's exactly um, linked, really, to the prospect of conflict resolution. Because if there is a way in which people can communicate with one another on a regular basis and have a regular understanding, it's apparent that that we can prevent conflict from breaking out and we can attempt to improve the little things in conflict zones by allowing people um, who live near them to try and live lives as normally as possible because they can keep in contact with their neighbours who um, live on the other side. Um, and you know, this isn't just limited to the issue of um, war and conflict in a traditional sense. We also have seen um, the issue of mass migration, um, which has caused a great deal of political tension in Europe in particular. And of course, as um, Efehan has, has mentioned in relation to a global common moral language, in Turkey, for instance, there is a lot of hostility towards a lot of the Syrian uh, refugees who live there. And so, when you take that into consideration, it's apparent that this anthropological bottom-up um, perspective can have, you know, applicability elsewhere. Of, you know, not just within the realms of geopolitics. And with that in mind, I think it's important when we consider how to uh, how to move forward, um, how how we can find a solution to the issue of war and conflict today. Um, uh, I think that the social and anthropological perspective should be kept at the forefront of our minds. Um, many of the people here, many of the attendants here who have worked in the field of international diplomacy will know um, how important and how influential personal diplomatic relationships can be in resolving conflict, preventing them from breaking out. And I think that if governments and international organizations proceed with with the same sort of approach in mind, a lot can be achieved. And for that reason, I think um, the in, uh, Natalia is going to talk about this in a minute. But you know, investing more in cultural and educational um, initiatives, Erasmus in Europe is a good example, can be a major way to advance this perspective. Um, and I think if we can. If if the United Nations, if if WAS can take this perspective on and approach conflicts and uh, wars and negotiations in the future from this perspective, I think a lot can be achieved in resolving the issues that we face today in geopolitics and uh, in regard to international conflict. And uh, that's what I want to say. So thank you. Beautiful, Tommy. Beautiful. Right on point. Uh, wonderful speech and. Uh... The lack of communication that uh, leads to uh, the deepening of the conflicts and how to serve as a bridge above those political games, it's definitely something to to be discussed. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, we managed to present this idea among others as well today. Um, so let's jump to our third speaker today. Uh, next, we have a distinguished uh, Muna. Uh, who is going to be our speaker today. And she is a senior program engineer with Navah Energy Company, boasting eight years of experience in the energy sector. So currently, Muna is a dedicated engineer at uh, Bakarach Nuclear Energy Plant and is uh, pursuing her doctorate art at Abu Dhabi University, focusing on the effects of safety, culture, and ethical leadership on nuclear plant safety performance. 
As a member of International Youth Nuclear Congress, Muna serves as the Climate Change Project Chair. So Muna's dedication to safety and ethical leadership in the energy sector is truly inspiring. And uh, we are very, very honored to be here to hear your speech today, Muna. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dora, for the introduction. And uh, you've um, pronounced uh, the project uh, in a different way. It's called uh, Baraka Nuclear Power Plants. <laughs> so just to make it clear for everyone. And uh, hello, everyone. I am honored to be here today and take part of this exciting uh, panel where I get to share my experience and thoughts. I would like to thank the organizers behind these great sessions we had. It took a huge amount of efforts and dedication to finally reach to where we are and to share our thoughts and perspectives. As a nuclear uh, energy engineer deeply engaged in shaping our energy future, I bring with me a passion uh, for innovation and sustainability. My journey began with a profound concern for our planet's climate, stimulated by my experience as an active member of the International Youth Nuclear Congress. Through this platform, I had a privilege of collaborating with like-minded individuals dedicated to exploring and advocating for solutions that address our global concern, uh, concerns and challenges. From my early days with the Youth Council to my current involvement with the women in nuclear organizations and government initiatives, I have witnessed first, uh, firsthand the transformative power of collective actions. Each step of my journey has reinforced my commitment to harnessing nuclear energy's potential as a clean, reliable source of power while con confronting the urgent uh, truth of climate change. Today, we gather here to discuss different critical issues. I am reminded of the importance of our collective uh, efforts. Together, we have the opportunity to shape policies, drive innovations, and inspire future generations to build a more resilient and sustainable world. I would like to address one of the most pressing challenges of our time, the intersection of energy, climate change, and the future of our planet. As a young voice in the energy sector, particularly in the context of uh, nuclear power plants, I am deeply aware of the critical importance of this discussion. The, the global community faces a dual crisis, the escalating climate change and the urgent need for sustainable uh, energy solutions. For years, our dependence on fossil fuels has drove economic growth, but at, uh, at a great cost to our environment. As we stand at the critical moment, the consequences of our action are frankly visible, uh, raising temperature, extreme weather events, and the looming threat of irre irreversible damage to the ecosystems. In my experience working uh, within the nuclear energy sector, I have come to appreciate its potential as a crucial part of the solution. Nuclear power offers clean, reliable, and scalable source of energy capable of meeting the world's growing demand without adding greenhouse uh, gases emissions. Unlike fossil fuels, uh, nuclear energy generates electricity without uh, producing air pollution or carbon dioxide. This mitigating climate change while providing a stable uh, baseload power supply. However, trans transitioning to nuclear energy is not without challenges. Safety concerns, waste management, and public uh, perceptions are significant obstacles that must be addressed through religious regulations, technological in uh, innovations, and transparent communication. It is imperative that we continue to advance research and development in nuclear technologies, ensuring they are safe, efficient, and economically feasible. Moreover, alongside the nuclear energy, we must accelerate the deployment of renewable energy sources such as wind, solar, hydroelectric power. Uh, these renewables offer complementary solutions, providing flexibility uh, and resilience to our energy uh, systems while reducing overall environmental impact. I would like to highlight as well education and advocacy are also a vital component uh, of our path forward. We must engage and empower the next generation of leaders, equip them, equipping them with the knowledge and tools to drive sustainable changes in their communities and beyond by fostering collaboration between governments, industries, and civil societies. Uh, we can forge a collective commitment to a cleaner and more sustainable future. In conclusion, the challenges posed by climate change and our energy 
needs are challenging, but they are not impossible. With innovation, determination, and shared commitment to sustainability, we can navigate this critical uh, crisis in history and build a future where energy is clean, abundant, and accessible to all. Our efforts today are not just about securing a, clearing, uh, a clean, uh, safer future for ourselves, but also preserving the wonders of our plant for generations to come. Uh, yet to come together, we can turn the tide against climate change and build uh, a brighter, more sustainable future for all. Thank you, Muna. I need to say that uh, your perspective, uh, your experience and knowledge was very important and crucial for our group uh, because it's a very specific topic since uh, nuclear energy overall is, is uh, still very stigmatized and uh, people are very divided when it comes to the opinion. Um, and as we always like to challenge different points of view, uh, that's why we deeply appreciate um, everything that we learned from you as well and your perspective. Uh, after Muna, we have our next speaker, uh, Puja. Uh, as I said, Puja is our next speaker. She is a remarkable individual uh, that is deeply involved in the activities of the World Academy of Arts and Science for the past eight years. Uh, Puja is a junior fellow of, of the Academy and also a key member of the research team at the Mar Mother Service Society. Uh, as we know, Mother Service Society is a center of excellence for the Academy. Uh, also, Puja is a passionate about education and currently works in human resources. Her insights and contributions to the Academy's community are very inspiring, and we are very happy to be hearing Puja today. So, Puja, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dora, for your kind introduction, and thank you so much to all the other panelists for their very interesting perspectives. I look forward to hearing Kishan and Natalia too. So what I want to say can actually be encapsulated in a single sentence that finds its place in the Russell Einstein Manifesto. Remember your humanity and forget the rest. This fundamental truth that we are all human beings sharing the same planet and facing similar challenges, it gets easily overshadowed by ideological, sociological and uh, political and cultural differences. And we are at a pivotal point in human evolution where our humanity must take precedence over all other considerations, be it opinions, feelings, disagreements, or conflicting thoughts. And it is imperative that we consciously place our humanity at the forefront, not only out of an ideological commitment, but also because of the practical reality of our interconnectedness. In today's world, an action in one place, it creates ripple effects across the globe. Uh, a technological invention in one country it revolutionizes industries worldwide. Industrial actions in one part of the world affect weather patterns and ecosystems globally. And even dropping hedge bombs on one place, it might seem like it might cause immediate de devastation only to a uh, minority, but it actually leads to a slow death of disease and disintegration for everyone. So we are all the beneficiaries of the cumulative knowledge, experience, and discoveries from around the world. And innovations in healthcare, technology, and communication, they demonstrate this interconnectedness and interdependence constantly. And if we take the trajectory of human history, we can see that that is a discernible direction. We're constantly moving from small isolated units to larger and more integrated entities. And we have come from considering our immediate ad our neighbors as adversaries to sharing a wider identity. We have come from tribes to city states to the 195 nation states that constitute global humanity today. And of course, these different regions and cultures are at various stages in their development. But despite these disparities, the bonds of interconnectedness and cooperation, they do continue to multiply among people and societies. And that is a growing consensus towards global unity. And we are witnessing a movement towards even greater relationship on a global scale. But the problem that looms over us now is, why at this crucial point in humanity, when we are faced with enormous opportunities, be it the technology revolution, globalization, increased awareness about human rights, why are we also facing a multiplicity of challenges that seem to be increasing in their complexity and seem too daunting to be overcome? And when we, and from our discussions, I realized that individuals and societies, they require considerable time to adjust to new realities. And 
it is in our tendency, human tendency to resist change. Habits and social institutions resist change and beliefs and values, they evolve very slowly. And for humans to maintain a psychological security and a sense of well-being, predictability and a sense of control are very essential. And societal changes that occur very gradually, they allow people to adapt over generations, but the and speed at which change is happening right now, it leaves very little room for this natural adaptation process. There is a constant influx of new technology. We're being bombarded with information and all these shifting social norms, they are creating a sense of instability and insecurity. And when all of these challenges are existing ways of life and deeply held beliefs and values, they undermine our confidence in the future and raise resistance to change and weaken social cohesion and also exacerbate these uh, feelings of insecurity, especially in those who kind of feel left out from this change or feel threatened by the direction and pace of this change. And to add to this, the pace of change is quite different in different communities, cultures, and parts of the world. And due to the pressures of globalization, they're all compelled to engage with each other. And these differences, it adds to the sense of difference and uh, creates a resistance, a defensive resistance towards change in older and more traditional communities. And this insecurity also drives individuals to look for a source which they can blame, an enemy, usually. And they and this also manifests in various ways, like they start longing for what seemed like a more sim simpler and stabler past, even though it came with its own set of challenges. And they also start rallying around the ideologies of leaders who promise to protect the status quo, to revive the past, to restore order and stability, even if it comes at the cost of social cohesion. But our generation, when it comes to our generation, we have been truly connected like no other point in human history. And this connectivity is a powerful asset that is going to keep developing in leaps and bounds. And the question that came to me is, why do we see such polarization in society when we have such a powerful asset in our hands? Why is it being used to regress into the divisions of the past in some parts of society, when instead of being used to embrace our connectedness and build a progressive and inclusive future? And I did realize that all this prevalent polarization from the macro level to the micro level, it stems from the thought that there is one truth, one view is right. This mindset that my point of view is right and the other person is wrong, it has been ingrained in us through various societal, cultural and educational systems. And this idea that there is only one absolute truth, it encourages binary thinking. And complex issues are being simplified into black and white terms, disregarding the nuances and the multiplicity of perspectives that might exist. And as Efan mentioned, tools that we use in today's world, they can expand our horizons, but they can also imprison us within walls. Like social media, it offers unlimited potential to uh, democratize information, like every individual gets a voice in the global conversation. But on the other hand, it also creates e echo chambers and silos where the algorithm shows us only information that we know would interest it. So, uh, so these biases, stereotypes and prejudices keep getting reinforced. And as and AI, which can drive in innovation and solve complex problems, is being used for warfare, cyber espionage, and violations of privacy. So until the mentality changes, the technology will serve the mentality, whether it is for peace or not. And this principle that tools serve the mentality extends beyond technological tools to encompass the larger institutions of governance, law, and regulations. Tools are designed to serve humanity, be it small-scale ones or large-scale ones, like institutions of global governance. Their effectiveness in, is inherently tied to the spirit and the mentality of the individuals using them. And we should not be believing in the sovereign power of this external machinery, because what really seals the deal is the human behind it. If the human's heart is not in it, it will fail. And in the case of global institutions and changes, it is the collective human consciousness behind so in the end, it all boils down to the fundamentals of human nature. For instance, the League of Nations had faltered because humanity was not fully ready to embrace its vision. Similarly, global governance institutions or any ideologies or any systems can only achieve temporary success if it is forcefully imposed because 
it is the collective aspiration behind it that matters. And for any missionary to be effective and lasting, the collective aspirations of the population must evolve. And organizations can stand only if people have internalized these principles and values that these structures embody. And for this to happen, we need to start working at the roots. And the best tool for it is education. If we consider education today, we constantly find ourselves comparing ourselves with others, trying to feel superior to them. And all this is because we've been taught a local identity. Our education it leads us to embrace a local identity, whether it is tied to a tribe, a community, or a nation. And when nation states develop, they sought to unify their populations by promoting a shared national identity. And this was done by highlighting historical victories, cultural achievements, and collective struggles among common enemies. And these government-supported national education systems, they were designed to instill pride in one's nation, foster loyalty, patriotism, and a sense of belonging, which it has succeeded in doing. But when history is taught from a narrow perspective like this, celebrating national victories and lamenting defeats, it creates an us versus them type of mentality where differences are highlighted and commonalities are overlooked. And it perpetuates cycles of superiority, competition, and conflict. So this focus on localized identities has profound implications on how we perceive ourselves and others, and it leads to division and conflict. In today's interconnected world, where anybody's problem is ours, the need to grow beyond nationalistic identities it stands tall. And in today's rapidly evolving world, the need for a new educational paradigm has never been more urgent. We need an education for humanity, an education that fosters human security, and something that can create a universal identity that transcends our local affiliations. And this super identity should be the cornerstone of our educational focus. Of course, it is essential to honor and embrace the identities of the past, because it is this rich cultural diversity of our local affiliations that has contributed to our collective human progress. But uh, the emphasis should be on our shared heritage, interconnectedness, and this creation of a common universal identity should supersede it or underlie all these local affiliations. Uh, I would like to end by saying this shift in education is not just a necessity, it is the foundation for a sustainable and peaceful future for all. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, uh, Puja, for your inspiring speech. Uh, and uh, I think we can see the commonality here in all of our speeches that we also got throughout our discussions prior to this panel, which is this real need to go above, go beyond this binary thinking, one truth, this pride that instills throughout education that we are all separate nations and exactly that is something that leads to division. And that universal identity that we are trying somehow to promote and that we are trying to implement also in the educational system to better be pride ourselves by how, uh, what's the thing that we are sharing, but the, what's the, what divides us. And this is something that perfectly sets the tone for our next speaker, Natalia. Uh, and Natalia is a multi-talented uh, individual who is a composer, culturologist, pedagogue, linguist, and a writer at the same time. She is a member of the Union of Composers and Musicologists and a member of several international music foundations. She is also the president of the Culture and Art Creators Guild and expert speaker in UNESCO Global Cultural Initiatives. Uh, also a founder of numerous international projects and recognized composer with a passion for integrating arts and scientists through innovating thinking methods. So Natalia's contributions to the cultural and educational landscape are remarkable and uh, that's why we are very excited to hear your speech today. Natalia, the floor is yours. Uh, I'm so happy and excited to be here and uh, I'm very grateful for this great honor to, to present my thoughts, my ideas, my experience with all my um, devotion to your great global initiatives. Uh, today we re uh, gather to address some of the most pressing challenges that humanity faces. Of course, our world is plagued by universal problems such as inequality, ignorance, conflict, and environmental degradation. These issues threaten the very 
fabric of our societies, under, undermining the potential for a harmonious and prosperous future. It is imperative that we can confront these challenges with innovative humanistic and cultural approaches that foster security, unity, and progress. The main point here is this, our true strength lies in the softness and gentleness of our souls. And at the heart of our global transformation lies culture. Culture is in its broadest sense, is the foundation of our identity and the bedrock upon which we build a peaceful, open society. Because culture and spirituality are inseparable. <clears throat> culture cultivates our humanity, fosters respect and promotes creativity and empathy. It teaches us the fundamental values that are universal across all societies. To truly harness the power of culture, we must prioritize, prioritize the cultural education, enriching our curricula with high art and diverse traditions to foster a global mind, mindset. To achieve this, we must establish global cultural exchange programs that encourage cross-cultural understanding and appreciation. These programs would involve partnership between schools, universities, cultural institutions, and great organizations worldwide by uh, fac facilitating student and faculty exchanges, collaborative projects, and cultural immersion experiences. We can foster a sense of global citizenship and mutual respect, securing scholarships and grants from international organizations, governments, and private donors will support inclusively uh, inclusivity and access for student, uh, through students from all socioeconomic backgrounds. By fostering cross-cultural understanding and appreciation, these programs will create a generation of global citizens equipped with uh, the empathy and knowledge to bridge the, the divides and promote peace. For these purposes, we should actively promote local cultural initiatives that celebrate the unique traditions and practices of communities. Local festivals, art exhibitions, and cultural heritage projects can enrich community life and strengthen local identity while fostering global awareness. By, create, <clears throat> by creating spaces where local cultures are celebrated and shared, we, we encourage pride in one's heritage while building bridges to other cultures. These events will showcase the richness of different cultures through music, dance, art, cuisine, fashion, much more. They will provide opportunities for people to learn about and appreciate other cultures, fostering a sense of global community, ensuring that, uh, that these cultural events are inclusive, which with, with activities and performances that engage people of all ages and backgrounds will help to break down barriers and build a more inclusive world. The art as an aesthetic and unify, unifying force plays a crucial role in this transformation. It harmoniously develops every aspect of our personality and connects us in profound ways. We must integrate the arts into our educational systems as they cultivate creativity, empathy, and a deeper understanding of our shared humanity. To achieve universal access to art education, governments and educational institutions must collaborate to integrate comprehensive arts programs to all educational levels, from primary school to universities. It would be great to establish artists in residence programs in school and communities. When I say artists, I mean a person who is engaged in any kind of art. These programs would bring professional artists into educational settings to inspire and mentor students, creating a dynamic and interactive learning environment by exposing students to working uh, to working artists. We can in, ignite their passion for the art and encourage them to explore their creative potential because art education fosters critical thinking, emotional intelligence, and creativity, preparing students to navigate in increasingly complex world with empathy and innovation. This is extremely important because art doesn't exist without love. This is 
love for creation for each other through connection with higher knowledge this is the uh, desire to improve our lives and our world especially enjoying co-creation as we embrace technology we must remain vigilant in its application artificial intelligence should serve serves as a tool, not a master. Its role must be carefully regulated to ensure it benefits humanity without under undermining our intri intrinsic values of cre or creativity. Um, AI lacks the emotional depth and moral compass that drive through artistic and scientific innovation. We must safeguard the human spirit, ensuring that technology in enhances our lives without eroding our initiative or compassion. To achieve this, we should control it through ethical and responsibility organization comprising experts in technology, ethics, law, and human rights. This organization will develop comprehensive guide guidelines for the ethical use of artificial intelligence, ensuring transparency and accountability in AI development and deployment, implementing a robust um, monitoring system to oversee AI applications will prevent misuse and ensure that AI technology augment human capabilities rather than replace them. Furthermore, we must promote public awareness, compliance, and education, educational programs to inform citizens about the uh, ethical implications of AI and empower them to engage in response in responsible AI use. Developing curricula that teach students about the benefits and risk of AI will foster a generation of tech savvy individuals who understand the importance of ethical consideration in technological advancement. Additionally, we should invest in AI resources that pr prioritize solving global challenges by directing AI development towards addressing issues such as climate change, healthcare, and education. We can harness its potential for the greater good, encouraging interdisciplinary collaboration between technologies, ethicists and social scientists will ensure that AI develop, development remains aligned uh, with human values and social needs. Uh, science too must be conducted with a deep sense of social responsibility. This is all aspects um, of uh, culture because it is our the main important part of our life from biological research to space exploration ethical standards and moral principles should guide scientific endeavors the social uh, sociological impact of scientific discoveries must be thoroughly analyzed to prevent inhuman consequences scientists must embrace their role as custodians of knowledge always mindful of the broader social, uh, societal implication of their work. To promote socially responsible science, we must embody ethical training or in scientific education, ensuring that future scientists are equipped to consider the social environment impact, uh, impacts in their work, establishing ethics committees at the universities and research institutions to oversee research projects will ensure they align with humanistic values and ethical standards. Launching initiatives to involve communities in scientific discussions will make science, uh, science and more will make science more accessible and accountable. Public lectures, open labs, and community science projects can bridge the gap between scientists and the public by demonstrating science and fostering dialogue, we can build trust and encourage responsible, responsible scientific practice that benefit all of humanity. Our focus must shift from the, the, uh, div division to unity. I am a strong believer in this. We must address conflicts with wisdom and empathy, seeking to understand each other's perspectives and motivations. By emphasizing our common values and fostering dialogue, we need to overcome what prevents us from living with dignity. We can overcome the temptations of base morally corrupting patients and primitive instincts guiding each other 
towards a path of enlightenment and collective well-being. To felic felicitate this, we should establish international peace and dialogue centers, especially in conflict-prone regions. These centers will serve as neutral spaces for representatives from different communities to discuss and resolve issues peacefully, offering medi mediation services, con conflict resolutions, training, and cultural programs that promote understanding and cooperation will equip individuals with the skills needed to navigate and resolve conflicts, Panther, partnering with local and international organizations to support these centers will ensure they have the resources and expertise needed to make a lasting impact. By fostering dialogue and understanding, these centers can help build bridge between divided communities, paving the way for sustainable peace. Additionally, we should implement peace education programs in schools and communities. These programs would teach conflict resolution skills, empathy, and inter intercultural understanding from the early age equipping future generations with the tools to build and maintain peace by incorporating peace education into the curriculum. We can cultivate a culture of peace that uh, permits all levels of, of society. As Kofi Annan said, education is a human right of immense value and potential. Freedom, dem democracy, and sustainable development are built on education. There is nothing more important, no mission other than education for all. I would like to develop this thought further and say that the right education can be a powerful unifying fo force. To strengthen this unifying force, we must clearly understand that theoretical knowledge simply by being taught will not automatically shape a person's worldview and everyday behavior, nor will it, will it instill profound existential values. In, real, in reality, there is a vast gap between knowledge and values, between knowledge and daily habits. The mere availability of information does not provide life with meaning or or teach individuals how to structure their lives effectively. Within this framework, humanistic pedagogy plays a crucial role because namely humanistic pedagogy aims to bridge this gap and establish harmony, uh, harmony between knowledge and such knowledge vital for a person's worldview, the individual's person core, his self-awareness, personal development and practical actions. It seeks to connect academic knowledge with existential and practical values, ensuring that education nurtures not only intellectual growth, but also ethical and civic responsibility by fostering a holistic development that includes ethical and axiological value-based education. Um, humanistic pedagogy helps students internalize and internalize universal moral principles, both towards, towards themselves and others. For mother, this approach cultivates the ability for ethical uh, uh, reasoning and critical ethical in injury, which are essential for human as both an educational and philosophical paradigm, distinguishing it from other educational models. By inter uh, integrating this principle, principles, humanistic pedagogy creates a learning environment where every student feels value, valued and empowered to contribute to global progress. Moreover, it aligns with the broadest humanistic approach in education, which integrates cultural elements to enrich learning experiences. In this case, the culture orientation in education enhances this humanistic approach. By incorporating cultural education, we promote understanding and appreciation of diverse traditions, fostering a sense of global citizenship, how I mentioned, before this combination Sorry, Natalia, of... just to let you know we are running out of time i'm getting messages uh so we okay. need to wrap up thank you so much uh i would like to end with uh, this uh, thought that in conclusion i would like to say that culture distinguishes us but doesn't not divide us education state policy culture and arts all play crucial roles in uh, un uniting people of different nationalities. As creators, we have the 
power to transcend boundaries using our talents to enlighten and unite humanity on the spiritual level. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Natalia. And I really hope that we will have uh, all of the uh, time to actually hear the questions and answer the question. Uh, our last but not the least speaker is uh, Kekeshan, and I would please like to ask you to keep it within five minutes so at least we can answer a couple of questions. A uh, small introduction, uh, Kekeshan is a Canadian environmental and human rights activist from United Arab Emirates. She advocates for peace, children rights, climate justice and sustainable development. She is the founder and president of Green Hope Foundation, the counselor of World Future Council, trustee of Parliament of World's Religions, and the winner of the International Children Peace Prize. Kekishan, the floor is yours. Thank you, and hello, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here, as always, to be a part of uh, the World Academy of Art and Sciences Conference. I'm also a junior fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science and a UN Human Rights Champion, so uh, wonderful to be here with all of you and speak on topics that are of, honestly, very critical importance uh, to all of us. And I think that in this day and age where we would be able to render foe and you don't know what it's going to do to you today. Uh, amazing. So as I was saying, it's always wonderful to be here as a junior WASP fellow and uh, okay. to speak on topics that are very important in this day and age. Uh, so before I begin, I'd actually like to share that uh, it, it's very easy for all of us to be in an environment where uh, we're sitting here uh, comfortable uh, trying to uh, speak about all of these global challenges. But as we're speaking right now, my thoughts are with 10 year old Endaya, who at this very moment is walking barefoot under the harsh sun towards a waterhole with a heavy pot balanced uh, on her delicate head in her daily elusive search for drinking water. And her daily ritual gets longer and more dangerous with every uh, passing summer as she you know, fends off wild animals and human traffickers so that she can reach home safely with this precious pot of water uh, on her head, which is for her family of 12. And that was her daily routine until she started attending school for the first time ever, which is a Green Hope Foundation project established in partnership with local stakeholders that is leveraging clean energy innovation to bring education to marginalized girls in these far-flung communities. So Endaya is amongst the fortunate few who now has the opportunity to be able to go to school and to be able to create change within her own sphere of influence. And that essentially is the work that we do at Green Hope Foundation, working across 28 different countries with over half a million people, wherein we work to address all of these global challenges that demonstrate to us the futility of wasting precious time by getting involved in the blame game. And over the last few years, there's been an evolving typecasting of young people wherein youth are generally portrayed as people who just talk and blame others. But we see that this is viewing us as young people very one dimensionally. And so our work at Green Hope Foundation, therefore, goes beyond blaming others. And it focuses on problem solving. And we see how there are different frameworks like the sustainable development goals that provide us with uh, a framework of action, for instance. But then again, we see that it is very important to localize these SDGs because we need a solutions-based approach towards a better future. And working across 28 countries with so many different kinds of people, it becomes very, very obvious that a one-size-fits-all solution is never going to work. So what we need, therefore, is for these solutions to understand what is going on at the grassroots level, to see what different solutions can exist to even a, same, a similar or same problem, and thereafter work with all stakeholders to create a more uh, just and equitable approach towards addressing these global challenges. So I wanted to take the opportunity to share a few of 
uh, these solutions with uh, you today. The first one, of course, being education for sustainable development, because with that knowledge, there is no way that we can act. So our sustainability academies, for instance, this is in Cambodia, work to ensure that young people, especially but all stakeholders, have the knowledge and the skill sets to be able to turn the knowledge that they gain from our academies into ground level action so that they can actually know how to think and act for a sustainable future. And thereafter, we work to install infrastructure that enables access to education. So our solar sewing school in Bangladesh, for instance, provides women and girls with the opportunities to utilize sewing as a way to earn a stable source of income and use that income to go to school themselves sometimes or even send their girls to school. Uh, our solar mobile libraries take books to the doorstep of thousands of out of school children, especially girls in climate vulnerable communities so that they can have access to learning. Our solar computer labs, the one I mentioned right at the beginning, uh, and our solar STEM labs provide access to at-risk youth to gain STEM education and IT literacy so that they can uplift their communities out of poverty, out of the impact of climate change. And from education, we go into addressing deeply taboo topics in very, very conservative communities. So for instance, addressing sexual and reproductive health and rights, something that is still seen as extremely taboo in uh, several communities across the world. Uh, women's menstrual hygiene, for instance, being one of uh, the key uh, drivers of inequity within these communities. So what our members do is that in our sewing school, for instance, they make sanitary napkins. They utilize that to educate the women and girls about their health, about their menstrual hygiene, and why it's so important for them to maintain uh, this hygiene for the betterment like of their own health as well as for the health of their children and their girls as well. And from addressing health, we go on to addressing water security, for instance, because that is a tremendous health concern as well. In uh, several small island developing states, one of the biggest challenges that we are seeing right now is climate change causing an influx of salty brackish water coming in. Uh, and so that means that their water sources, like the groundwater, is being polluted with salt. And so you can't drink it. So our solar water farm in Caribis, uh provides clean drinking water to the indigenous communities by using distillation to purify both the groundwater and the rainwater. Similarly, to address water insecurity in another community across the world, in Bangladesh, our deep bore tube wells and rainwater harvesting systems purify the groundwater as well as the rainwater to provide the communities with clean drinking water. In Kenya, our water storage containers uh, ensure that the children don't have to walk miles in the sun to fetch water and can instead store the water. Health, hygiene, and sanitation, once again, are all interconnected with this because with water insecurity, we also see lack of access to proper sanitation. So we build toilets in communities that don't have the basic human right of access to a toilet. And in fact, this woman on this slide actually stayed with us through the entire installation of the toilet because she said that she never ever imagined that in her lifetime she would be able to see a toilet being built for women and girls to provide them with the dignity of being able to having access to a toilet. We work to install hand washing stations because even hand washing is not seen as a basic human right or the infrastructure to provide this basic human right. And in many communities, we see how women and girls especially are facing respiratory issues because they uh, delve, they work with very unclean methods of cooking that ensure that the smoke goes directly into their faces and into their lungs. And that also contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. But in this way, by training them on using solar, electric, and eco-cookers and distributing this amongst them, we're ensuring that we're protecting the health of women and girls uh, and ensure that they don't uh, get respiratory diseases as a result of this. And speaking of cooking, food security is another extremely big food insecurity, rather, is a huge issue that needs to be addressed globally. And so we work in both urban and rural areas in this context with urban farming in UAE, in Canada, in Suriname, encouraging and teaching young people why it's so important to practice urban farming in their own spheres of influence to create local circular bioeconomies. 
And in more rural communities, we grow food in pots. In Caribbean, for example, as I mentioned, uh, the salty water that pollutes the groundwater also makes it very difficult to grow crops in the soil. And so food in pots is a solution that uh, helps them grow their own food. Uh, in Peru, working with indigenous women to reclaim land that had previously been lost to only growing cash crops and ensuring that they get food security in that manner. Harnessing clean tech for food security, utilizing agrivoltaics uh, to ensure that rural women farmers and rural young farmers are able to increase their crop yield by more than 30% by harnessing clean tech for agriculture. And finally, we see that, you know, I've talked a lot about the physical impacts, but we see that all of these global challenges have a terrible uh, mental uh, impact on our mental health and well-being. And so we work to address this through simple solutions that people might think have, have no impact, but actually do. And one of the very simple solutions is building solar streetlights in communities where women and girls feel unsafe coming out of their homes in the evenings, something that is exacerbated by climate change induced disasters. And so in this way, they're actually able to have the freedom to come out of their homes in the evenings and feel safe going to school in the mornings for the children uh, and for the women coming out of their homes in the evenings and just not having to fear traffickers or exploitation or rape and abuse. And so I share these solutions with you today because it is important for us to understand that multidimensional issues require multidimensional solutions. And our work is testament to the fact that a dollar if invested smartly, goes a very long way in not only bringing about social and environmental change, but also in creating new avenues of this economic growth that is inclusive and is driven from within the community. So true sustainable development addressing all the three pillars. And over the last more than a decade now, our solutions have benefited over half a million people. However, that is just a drop in an ocean of 8 billion people. So to provide scale we to of like to work such as ours we still need to understand that this is largely driven by non-state actors and we need robust policies and a drastic realignment of our financial support systems to support these grand level solutions and the current crises have tested our ability to deal with these large scale disruptions so it's now time for us to build our legacy as something of a more resilient society. And our work proves that it is possible to innovate for a sustainable world through ground level solutions. All it requires is intent. Thank you. Thank you, Kegeshan. Um, unfortunately, I do not think uh, we have time for our questions. Uh, incredible presentation by Kegeshan at the end. Uh, so if you have any kind of questions for our panelists, for our speakers, feel free to send them in a chat and uh, we can reach uh, back to you afterwards. And uh, thanks, thanks, huge thanks to our amazing speakers.